We just, we just had a couple more people join. So I'll give it a, one more minute. Okay, I, I want to welcome everybody who's here. Uh, and this is the Erratics, which is the Wenatchee chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute. And normally the president of our chapter, Brent Kunderlow, would introduce things, but he's not, he's not available right now. He's off traveling, I believe. So I get the honor instead. I am Ralph Dawes and I teach geology here at Wenatchee Valley College. And here we are for our August meeting of the Wenatchee Valley Erratics um, for the Ice Age Floods Institute. And it's one of our every other month meetings where we have a presentation from an expert speaker about something related to Ice Age floods usually, or at least something geologically that ties into the Northwest. And we are really lucky to do our, even though it's in Zoom, at least we still get to do our annual, have our annual visit and presentation from Dr. Vic Baker, something of a tradition um, because he is up here in the Northwest in the summer times. And, and, and we, we've, been, we've been lucky over the years to get a lot of visits from Dr. Baker, including the, the talk we have in August for several years in a row now. And that continues with this year. Okay, so Dr. Vic Baker, uh, is uh, has has a lot of accomplishments behind him related to research on the Channel Scab lands and the, and the mega floods, the giant floods that swept across you know much of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and and his work in this goes back to when he was a grad student and he met um, and interacted with J. Harlan Bretz back in the day, and and Dr. Baker applied uh, among other things numeric and you know he calculated how these floods could work more in, in ways that that uh brett said not pursued um and he, and he got to know this landscape dr baker did even before he was dr baker back when he was a grad student and and this so that goes back to the early 1970s um but and then having become familiar with the this landscape and the, and the types of features left by these giant floods dr baker and other people along the way started realizing that similar features were seen in other places, like in, in parts of what's now Russia. And also when we started getting satellite photos showing the details of the surface of Mars in the mid 1970s, well, I, you can see where this is going. This gets us to the topic for tonight's talk. So I should just pass on the baton here and introduce from the University of Arizona, uh, Dr. Vic Baker to talk about, oh, I lost the title, but uh, we're gonna talk about the floods on Mars and what we now know going way back to, I think, the early days of Mars, but he'll tell us about that. So welcome to Dr. Baker, and I will step aside. OK, thank, thank you, Ralph. Uh, I, I hope people hear me. Um, I will uh, go to the share screen. Um, let's see. I, I'm not showing my screen. For sharing, uh, just showing the whiteboard. Just the whiteboard. Uh, yeah. Um, hmm. So, uh, what did we do differently last time to get it to start working? I oh, I don't. I, I don't know. I'm. I, I've switched to my screen, and it says I'm sharing. But if you can't see it, then something is 
a miss. Is is it up on your desktop? Is it open up? On it's your up on it's up on my desk. This my uh, desktop is up. Okay. Yeah. If you want to stop sharing again and see if that when you open up that um open up that share screen box try share screen again do you see one of the little boxes that's in that share screen your as your no, desk no i don't I, I just get the whiteboard box i don't get the uh i don't get the box with my screen on it you had that figured out last time um try opening it try try expanding your presentation and seeing opening it up in front of you uh, okay if it's if it's minimized maybe i don't i don't uh, I don't know. Did is it is it up now? I, I, I I'm what it's giving me is the whiteboard. Yeah. And uh, I want uh, let's see. I want to get the. I want to get my screen, not the whiteboard. Yeah. Want to email me your presentation while you're chatting and i'll see if i can get it up there for you it's probably a, a too large a file um it, it is a large file uh yeah yeah I'd, uh, yeah the only things i can go to are uh in basic it gives the whiteboard in advance. It doesn't give, I, I can't pull up my screen on the. Um, have you, do you have the presentation open on your computer? Yeah, I, I can open it, but, but it's going to just be on the, it's open now, but it's on the screen. So if you, that, if you then in Zoom, maybe try share screen again, maybe it'll be a choice. I'm just guessing here uh okay yeah that i think that did it so do you see it now yes okay good so i can start okay uh so um so the title is the oceans of mars which sounds a bit bizarre uh, any of you who've seen the movie the martian uh, no, Matt Damon was in a uh, pretty desperate place, very dry, very cold. And so in the uh, lower right, you see a question mark about ancient Mars, because Mars today looks like that picture in the middle. Uh, it's, uh, you notice for one thing, it's not red. Uh, Mars looks a little reddish when you look at it uh, in, the, in the sky, but that's because you're looking at it through Earth's atmosphere, and that changes how Mars looks. This kind of brownish color is the color that uh, Mars has. And uh, over on the right, you see what Mars may have looked like about 4 billion years ago, a long time ago. Uh, and that's got a big water body on the surface. And that, that's part of this story. It's an old story. Uh, Ralph mentioned the, um, the, the channels and flood features on Mars. And, and I did a book on that about 40 years ago. But what I'm gonna talk about is um, how I got to that point, how I got to the idea about oceans on Mars, and also a lot about current uh, Mars exploration. So let's see if I can change slide. Okay, so here, first slide. Now you're seeing something that impressed me uh, when I was about six years old. This is a scene from the movie War of the Worlds based on the famous H.G. Uh, Wells story. And you see uh, a Martian uh, spacecraft 
that is uh, destroying uh, uh, portions of our planet. I was scared to nightmare uh, status because of this. But this was my first experience with Mars. Now, the science at that time, this would have been, let's say around 1951, was that uh, Mars was observed through telescopes. And at the upper left, you see what a camera would take through a telescope. And this is, this is at Lowell Observatory, which is in Northern Arizona. It was uh, created by a famous but eccentric astronomer named Percival Lowell. And you can sort of in the picture make out that there's uh, breaks between dark areas and light areas. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere interferes with how we see Mars. And there are periods when the atmosphere sort of clears and other times when it uh, goes uh, very uh, poor, like through a uh, out of focus lens. And the astronomers who saw it when they thought it was clear, thought they recognized lines that separated the dark and light areas shown in the lower left. In the 1950s, uh, it was thought that the dark areas might even represent vegetation because it was known that Mars had these white areas at the poles and it was uh, obviously assumed that, that those were ice caps and that, that the planet, even though uh, it didn't have evidence through these images of any particular uh, water courses, was thought to uh, maybe have melting of this uh, polar ice. So here's a picture of Percival Lowell around the change uh, in the millennium from the 1800s to the 1900s. And he's looking through his great uh, refractor uh, telescope that he, he was very wealthy. He uh, inherited a huge amount of money from a uh, Boston uh, uh, family that was, uh, you know, a, a, a incredible wealth. And he built his own observatory and he built it to look at Mars. And you see at the right, one of his drawings. And he thought these features were quite linear. And he followed an Italian astronomer, uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, it, who named these features channels. But the word for channels in Italian is canali. Uh, Lowell made the uh, interpretation of constructed canals. And this, of course, implied uh, civilization and led to science fiction, like I showed in the previous picture. So our understanding of Mars was very limited at this time. By the way, there were a lot of scientists who didn't believe Lowell and thought that uh, he was a bit of a crackpot. But that's another story. So here's a picture of Mars from the space telescope called Hubble that was uh, launched from Earth. It was taken by the uh, Skylab uh, or, or the actual the, the space shuttle. It was taken up into orbit and it uh, is in a position where it can look out into the universe without the interference of the atmosphere. So you can see that it's a, a crisper picture than you get from a ground-based telescope, but there's no, there's no indications of these lineations. You do see the light and dark areas. Uh, it really wasn't until the early 1960s that spacecraft were launched to Mars. Uh, a, a whole series of them this, this was following the uh, Sputnik and the beginning of the space race. At that time, uh, the former Soviet Union uh, had six missions that they launched to Mars prior to 1964. All of them failed. The seventh mission launched to Mars uh, 
it was called Mariner 4. It was a US mission. There were, there were I believe, a, a couple of US missions that failed. Uh, Mar Mar one of the Mariners was a Venus mission. If the, that spacecraft in approaching Mars, uh, if Percival Lowell is correct, uh, this is an artist's picture as to what that spacecraft would observe. And it, the lineations would be as shown in this uh, picture on the right, uh, a uh, canal that is created by the melting of water from the polar caps of Mars. Here's a, the first spacecraft picture generated from Mars. It was generated in 1964, and it used, uh, similar to the old big box uh, television cameras, you might remember from, or some of you might remember from the early days of television, uh, called the Viticon camera. And what it shows are impact craters. See these circular features? They're pretty big, uh, tens of kilometers across. And this bright area is actually the margin of a very large impact crater. Uh, the flyby only took pictures of these impact craters. And at that time, it was known that the moon was also covered by impact craters. And at the result was that Whereas Mars previously thought it might have vegetation, it might have uh, you know, linear features on it, all of that was shown to be wrong. And it was thought that maybe Mars was nothing but impact craters. There was some suggestion that unlike the moon, the uh, margins of the impact craters had been worn down, perhaps by wind because Mars uh, was recognized to have a thin atmosphere. And so here's an artist's picture uh, done in 1969 based on this early data. Uh, there was even a thought in the space program in the, in the 60s when uh, lunar exploration was going on, if you remember the, the moon landings, that there would be uh, nothing really that interesting for Mars, and we may as well spend our time studying uh, the moon. I remember when I was in uh, graduate school in the late 1960s, I had some colleagues that were studying uh, the moon, and all they were doing was mapping impact craters. And I wasn't very interested in that, uh, so I never thought I would be interested in uh, planetary science at all. I was, uh, as Ralph said, I, I was studying catastrophic flooding for my dissertation, and particularly working in the, the Scabland area of Eastern Washington. Uh, so what we knew about Mars at that time was that it was a very uh, cold, dry place. It had a uh, surface that had been colored by iron oxides. Uh, the oxygen had probably come out of the atmosphere and combined with rocks on the surface. So uh, there was knowledge of the atmospheric composition. This can be told from, uh, to some degree from, uh, from telescopes because the uh, gases in the atmosphere produce spectra that can be recognized in the telescopes. So uh, the three planets, Mars, Venus, and Earth have very different atmospheres. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere we're familiar with, it, it has a pressure uh, a value one uh, atmosphere or bar. The pressure of the Mars atmosphere is only one hundredth of that. And the pressure of the Venus atmosphere is a hundred times that. So Venus has this immensely thick atmosphere. It's almost like being under the ocean. The, the atmospheric pressure is so great. The temperatures are totally different. Earth has te average temperature around room temperature, about, about, about 68 degrees, 20 degrees uh, centigrade. Mars is incredibly colder than that. And Venus is incredibly hotter. The atmospheric Venus is 99% uh, carbon dioxide. That is the reason all that carbon dioxide and the uh, greenhouse effect makes Venus a hothouse. Uh, Mars is carbon dioxide, but 
there's so little of it, it really doesn't produce enough greenhouse. And then the other ga gases are uh, relatively minor for Venus and Mars. Earth, of course, has largely a nitrogen atmosphere. And Earth has this incredible amount of oxygen, good for us, because we'd be long dead if there wasn't that oxygen in our atmosphere. So here's a uh, little picture depicting various spacecraft that have been launched to Mars. I'm not gonna talk about all of these. And also uh, some of the landers that have been launched and the little flags show the countries. So you see these initial ones, the red, that, that's the former Soviet Union. Here's the Mariner 4 here. And, and it goes around coming up to uh, close to the present day. This was done a few years ago. The spacecraft that certainly changed my uh, career and changed totally how Mars was viewed was launched in 1971. This was when I uh, got my PhD and I started teaching at the University of Texas. And in the early 70s, around 72, 73, pictures started coming from the surface of Mars from this spacecraft. It was almost like Mars was trying to hide its, uh, its interesting things from us because when the spacecraft arrived at Mars, you see the top of this picture, that is a Mariner picture from the arrival time. It looked like a uh, white cue ball. The reason is that Mars periodically has intense dust storms so much so that the entire atmosphere is made uh, opaque and reflective by all the dust. Very slowly, over a matter of months, and this was an interesting thing because the, the former Soviet Union had a, had a um, I, I think they had a uh, satellite at the same time, but it, 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 uh, it, its lifetime wasn't long enough. Uh, but the Mariner was able to last long enough. And as the uh, atmosphere cleared, the scientists were shocked to see channels, not canali, uh, the Italian word for channels, but real channels. And you see this one is meandering. Uh, it's called Nergal Valles, and it has tributaries. Uh, Later, in some of the missions I'll talk about subsequently, when we got very high resolution pictures, we see that those craters that were in that uh, earlier uh, depiction from 1964 and the Mariner 4, yeah, the, you had the craters, but look at all this dissection that is taking place in between these craters. These craters, uh, the, these are several tens of kilometers across. And you notice there are fluvial channels that come into the craters. And uh, more recent data shows that the floors of these craters, basically, all, they all had lakes in them, lakes of water. Uh, and, and the other thing is, you notice that these channels uh, and valleys, they have impacts on top of them, which means that they're very old. Uh, Earth. Uh, the surface of the Earth only has uh, a, maybe a, about 200 impact craters on it. Uh, there are many more than that just in this little area of Mars. And you can sort of take the number and sizes of the impact craters as an indication of the age of a uh, planetary surface. The thing that surprised me and made me a Mars scientist starting just about 50 years ago, was that some of these features that were made by flowing water had to be made by incredible huge floods of water. And of course, I had just done my PhD dissertation on uh, the Channel Scab Land. So here you see uh, some of the, the Mariner uh, 9 pictures you see that the water flow diverges and reconverges. You see that uh, there are uh, sort of teardrop shapes that are created by the flow of water. This is called streamlining. And you see there's, uh, there's uh, sources of water 
this is coming from an area of collapsed terrain. Uh, things converge and you get very large channels. Here you see with a scale of uh, 100 kilometers, you've got multiple channel waves that diverge and reconverge. Well, that was exactly what I had seen in the channel scab lamp. So here's a map that I had produced uh, just, uh, just before the Mars uh, uh, imaging uh, came available for some of the scab lamp channel waves. And uh, I knew that in areas like the Afreda fan in the Quincy Basin, the pattern looked uh, really similar to that one of those uh, separating uh, uh, channel waves and reconverging. Uh, the arrows show the pattern of the cataclysmic Missoula floods through this uh, topography and the uh, areas in between the flooding are covered by the Palouse Luss, which is shown in the magenta color. So here's some of the detailed mapping that we were doing in the scab lands around this time. Uh, here is one of these uh, hills of residual loess. Uh, it's uh, this one over here on the left of the map that was made of that area. Again, the blue shows the water flow directions, and the shape of this is uh, it, 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 you know it's, it's shaped like a, a trout or a salmon in a stream of water. Uh, if you look down on them, they have a, a streamlined shape to them. And, and the water has done this, but this had to be incredibly deep, uh, high velocity flows of water. Uh, next to the, uh, to the streamlined hill is uh, Butte and Basin Scabland topography. And we saw that sort of thing on Mars as well. So back around the mid 1970s, I. Uh, with some colleagues began to publish on this idea and people found out about the floods on Mars. Uh, it even became a matter of uh, some humor in the, uh, because Mars had been viewed as a result of Mariner 4 as this very cold, dry place. The possibility that there was, uh, had been big floods on Mars, that there had been a lot of water created a lot of excitement about well, if there's water, perhaps there could have been life. And following Mariner 9, uh, the space program was going very strong. It had just had the lunar landings. Uh, and they put together a very expensive, very elaborate mission uh, called Viking. It was the plan that two spacecraft, Viking 1 and Viking 2, would uh, converge on Mars in 1976. Both of them carried pods with big uh, stable landing platforms. And from these, uh, they would be released. Uh, a parachute would be used to drop the lander on the surface. And the first one of these was to land uh, uh, on July 4th, 19. 76. So 200 years anniversary. Unfortunately, uh, the orbiters, which were trying to pick the safety for the landing site, uh, determined that the initial planned site was too rough. It had a lot of boulders. So they weren't able to land until I think a couple of weeks uh, after that July 4th date. So here's uh, what that uh, 1976 lander, the Viking 1 lander looked like. Viking 2 looked exactly the same. It had a big sample arm that scooped up a sample and then they delivered to these uh, the laboratory uh, devices on the surface of the uh, spacecraft. Uh, there were three uh, experiments to determine if life was present. And these were designed by some of the best biologists who thought they really knew how we could measure for life. And they made uh, some different assumptions about how, how life might be found. Uh, uh, they would uh, look for the chemical reactions that took place. So I, I can't go into the details of these, but I wanna note this one uh, that involved a heating of the sample 
and a labeling of the carbon that would interact with the uh, carbon in the sample with uh, radioactive carbon 14. And the reason that's interesting <laughs> is that in advance, the scientists said, if any one of these uh, uh, experiments were to show a positive result, then they would know for sure that there was life on Mars. And something many people don't know because NASA was keeping it kind of uh, under wraps is that this experiment, this, uh, this uh, pyrolytic experiment had a positive result. That would have been big news. The reason they didn't release that was there was another instrument on the spacecraft that made measurements that could determine the amount of carbon that was in the soil sample. And there was no detectable carbon at all. So this meant that if there was carbon, uh, if there was no carbon, that something else made that result happen. And that result uh, lasted for a long time. It was only in the last uh, decade that another spacecraft is actually one that my university, University of Arizona, was heavily involved in, uh, landed in the polar areas of Mars and did more sophisticated analyses of the Mars soil. And they found a compound in the Mars soil uh, called the perchlorate. And this compound, if you run the experiment with a sample from Earth that has carbon in it, and you have perchlorate in that soil, you will get a result that shows no carbon present because it's destroyed by the perchlorate. <clears throat> and Mars has lots of perchlorate. So the Viking result is not, not certain. It, it was, it's a non-result. It could well have had carbon in the soil. And so we don't know if there was an actual uh, 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 living organism in that Martian soil. Okay, there's lots more to find out. Uh, although the, the huge $2 billion was spent on the uh, Viking missions, and <laughs> I'm telling you that the main thing of the mission was a, a, a result that it doesn't give you either yes or no. Uh, that sounds pretty bad. Uh, but actually, for me, uh, Viking was terrific because here you see that channel uh, from Mariner data, and here you see it in Viking data. The orbiter of Viking was terrific. It had a tremendous increase in resolution. So we were able to look at the whole pattern of these giant channels on Mars. Uh, here's the one that was shown earlier. It's a big channel called Kasai Valis. It's about 3,000 kilometers long. And you can see there are these big channel ways. The, one of the uh, unusual things about them is they, uh, the big outflow channels, uh, many of them initiate from subsurface sources. So as the uh, watery fluid came out, the surface collapsed and produced what's called chaotic terrain. You can see some of it in here. The, these channels were able to be mapped from Viking, but the base that I'm showing here is a topography that comes from later mission data. Uh, and the red is the high topography <coughs> and the blue is the low topography. The channels on Mars that carried the immense floods are the biggest we know about so far in the universe. So what you see here is a series of cross sections and the uh, cross sections, they're exaggerated quite a bit in the vertical in order to do the comparison. But way down in the corner, you see the biggest river in the US, the Mississippi. And over here, you see the biggest river on earth, the Amazon. And here is a Missoula flood channel. Uh, actually the Rathdrum Prairie, it's a pretty big one. 
Uh, Ralph mentioned my work in Siberia. Uh, it's actually an area called the Altai. This is <coughs> one of the Altai channel ways. Uh, this is the Bosporus Strait that separates, uh, it, it goes through Istanbul, separates Europe from Asia. Uh, this is the Strait of Dover. This is the Strait of Gibraltar. Why am I showing those? Those were also created by catastrophic floods. We did not know that until recently. The English Channel that separates England from France is a catastrophic flood channel. Sea level rise has risen to uh, cover it. The Strait of Gibraltar is the largest catastrophic flood channel that we know about. It was not made by freshwater, it was made by seawater. Uh, and uh, these numbers are the flow of water that went through these called the discharge. These are the top are two of the Martian channels. They had immense amounts of water. The quantity of water in all of the catastrophic flood channels is measured by the same unit that we use for measuring ocean currents. So this is something completely different than what we can th think is happening on the earth today. The ones on the earth represented very special conditions and they're the, they would be the subject of a whole other talk. So here's another uh, depiction of one of these giant outflow channels, uh, Kasai Valis. And again, the red areas are the high topography and you have lower areas. You can see this chain of craters along here. This is mar uh, marking the margin of a giant impact basin. The whole uh, northern part of Mars is a large basin of low topography. And you notice this channel comes out and it enters right into this basin, the, the northern part of Mars. It was pretty clear from this evidence and from other evidence that I don't have time to elaborate completely, <coughs> that there, water had to pond in the northern plains creating a temporary ocean-sized water body relative to Mars. You also notice that uh, the uh, channels coming into Mars, there's no delta where these flowed in. And when I presented these ideas initially, uh, some of my colleagues criticized this. Why is there no delta? Well, why is there no delta at the mouth of the Columbia River? Anybody know? The Columbia River was impacted by catastrophic floods. The immense floods that went down the Columbia River did not produce a delta. The, they came in at such high velocity that the sediment just spread over the abyssal plain of the Pacific Ocean. And the Northern Plains of Mars is covered by sediments that were introduced by these catastrophic floods. So that's another line of evidence for, uh, for the catastrophic flooding. So here is a, uh, we published this by the way, 30 years ago. Uh, it it's, uh, was a controversial paper when it came out. It remains controversial. Some people have written whole books trying to disprove it, but it's still around. It doesn't go away uh, because there's just a lot of evidence for it. Uh, so here's a kind of a cartoon picture of Mars showing these big uh, outflow channels uh, shown in, in the red, and then the distribution of the Northern Plains Ocean. Uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Arizona called it uh, Oceanus Borealis, the Northern Ocean. Uh, so the other thing we found about this is that it formed episodically. It didn't form just once. It formed and then went away and then formed again. All of this prior to about 3 billion years ago. So only very early in the history of Mars. So here's another uh, depiction of this. <coughs> and uh, here's a, a polar view showing that there were different uh, levels 
that formed at different times in this uh, ocean. Uh, so here on this uh, cross section, there's a level one and a level two. <clears throat> and uh, they uh, have evidence on their margin that shows uh, how, how big these water bodies were. In later work, here's a paper from 10 years ago, uh, people have discovered deltas on the margins of the Northern Plains oceans. Uh, but these are from much smaller channel waves, not from the big outflow channels. And uh, I'll show, uh, here's, here's one of my favorite ones. Here's a delta uh, that's formed in an impact crater. And you can see the distributary uh, channels of the delta. Uh, it looks kind of like a tulip. Uh, and you also see there are a lot of impact craters on the surface of the delta, which shows that it is quite ancient. This delta probably is about 3 billion years old. So here's a, uh, a map uh, a bunch of colleagues and I did uh, about five years ago, showing uh, in red the distribution of the little valleys that I mentioned earlier that dissect the highlands of Mars, and shown in blue uh, some of the different uh, levels of the large water body that formed on the northern plains of the planet. This idea was, as I said, controversial. Uh, there was even a, a two-page spread in Science Magazine, which is sort of the most prestigious of the publications in science, referring to this as an outrageous hypothesis. Uh, and uh, throughout the, the 90s, there was a lot of uh, argument about this. It's part of a pattern in uh, Mars studies, and I, I tried to diagram this one time, where you have uh, an, an alternation between what uh, I have called hydrophilia, meaning love of water, meaning uh, those who think that Mars had a lot of water, at least at some time in its history, and hydrophobia, where you have a, a fear that uh, a, a, a thought is more scientifically that, you, that Mars didn't have much water. So in the days of Percival Lowell, of course, you had all this uh, water and uh, uh, as Lowell's canals got discredited, people still believed in uh, vegetation and the like. Mariner 4 came in 1964, and it looked like Mars was just totally dry and dead and just like the moon. But then Mariner 9 and Viking came, and you got uh, a, a, a resurrection in this. Uh, this period from about uh, the mid 70s to the late 90s was a 20 year period in which there was almost no Mars spacecraft and exploration. But that changed. And one of the things that changed it was the famous Martian meteorite. That, that's a whole other story. But there was this uh, uh, piece of rock that had come from Mars that was interpreted as having living organisms in it. That's largely been uh, discredited. Uh, it, was, it had problems with the nature of the measurement. There's still some evidence that's equivocal that, that hasn't been completely taken away, but largely <laughs> that idea has gone away. And we have, we've had in recent years, an incredible number of missions, which I will go over fairly quickly <clears throat> to update you on some of what has been happening in recent years and particularly how that relates to the ocean idea. So beyond Viking, we've had lots of landers. So here's the Viking lander site one and Viking two. <clears throat> Uh, up here is the Phoenix site that I briefly mentioned where the perchlorates were found. In the late 90s, we had uh, two missions that were very important. One of them, Mars Global Surveyor, produced 
the topography that's shown on this map, very important for our geological understanding. And another mission, a kind of favorite of mine, was the first lander and the, that had a rover, a little uh, robot that moved around on the surface. And this robot was named Sojourner. So here's a picture of Sojourner, it's a little tiny thing. It's a, <clears throat> about the size of a child's toy. I, I got to uh, interact with a, uh, a little uh, sort of prototype uh, in uh, the Afraid of Fan area of Eastern Washington because they actually did the uh, tests uh, on earth for this in the Channel Scab land because the landing site was in the uh, area uh, where some of these big outflow channels come out. So this is Sojourner on Mars uh, coming up to one of these rocks. And here's a picture from the, uh, the, the lander out of which Sojourner left uh, showing two hills <clears throat> on the orbital images. These are streamlined hills, <coughs> just like in the channel scab land. And the area is littered with large boulders, like you can see on the Afraid of Fan uh, in the scab lands. Uh, when I was the president of the Geological Society of America, uh, I was able to give a honorary uh, fellowship in the society to a robot. Uh, the people from the Jet Propulsion Lab came and they brought uh, a model of Sojourner, the, the real Sojourners on Mars, of course, and I was able to confer on the Sojourner robot, Geological Society of America membership and fellowship. <clears throat> Another mission that I got involved in because it was uh, operating uh, from my university was one that used nuclear physics to show that there is lots of water on Mars today. Uh, it's a fairly complicated uh, explanation. The mission's called Odyssey, and it relies upon uh, uh, neutrons and gamma rays, which are part of uh, nuclear reactions. But it turns out that water contains hydrogen, and uh, it, you can measure elemental hydrogen by the uh, gamma rays that hit the surface and reflect other kinds of radiation back to an instrument that is uh, carried by the spacecraft. And what the, uh, the map of Mars on the right shows in the colors is in blue, the uh, greatest percentage of hydrogen, which will be in the form of water uh, on the planet. You see the polar areas have huge percentages of uh, hydrogen near the surface. Uh, some of the highlands in the middle parts have much less. Uh, Another uh, spacecraft had a radar penetrator, and this penetrated the surface, giving reflections back. And these arrows on this part of the reflection, the dark area is a mountain, and the uh, surface here is the interface between ice and uh, underlying rock. Uh, so this, this area here, which is probably a couple of hundred meters thick, is all ice. It's probably covered by a layer of rock. You can see the bright surface there. <laughs> and uh, that is on Mars today. Mars has thick amounts of ice in the uh, equatorial areas and also in its poles. <clears throat> by the 2000s, the landers got big. Uh, this is the uh, Opportunity Lander, part of the Mars Exploration Rover mission uh, that's uh, operated, this guy operated on Mars until just about a year ago. So it, it, it was a going uh, device. Uh, these did extensive exploration. They had lots of laboratory capabilities. Uh, it would take many lectures to cover the results from this. There also were, have been much higher powered uh, reconnaissance uh, orbiting spacecraft. Uh, the uh, Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter 
uh, flu at about the, the same uh, time. The uh, opportunity, one of its big discovery was sedimentary rocks. It, it had previously been thought that Mars was just impact uh, debris and uh, uh, volcanic rocks. But here you see the bedding of uh, uh, giant dunes. If you're familiar with areas in like Zion National Park, where there are sandstones that were laid down by big uh, Aeolian dunes in the Jurassic period, <clears throat> these uh, rocks on Mars are basically like that. There were also fluvial sediments. Uh, the, these are uh, deltaic sediments uh, that were observed with the cameras that were on the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. In 2014, we had an even bigger uh, lander uh, called Curiosity. It uh, landed in a impact crater called Gale that had a mound of thick sedimentary rocks in the center of it. Here's a picture uh, from that lander of the sedimentary rocks in uh, the center of, of Gale. It landed in a low area over here near the output from a fluvial valley. Uh, this fluvial valley is called Peace Vallis. <coughs> and here it, you see the topography where Gale is located. It's on the boundary between the Northern Plains Ocean, shown in the blue and purple, and the Southern Highlands, which are heavily cratered, shown in the, uh, in the green, uh, yellow, and red. The, uh, prior to the mission, it was clear that the lander was going to be close to uh, the mouth of the alluvial fan that comes out of Peace Vallis. And when it uh, landed in this area of uh, high thermal inertia, which would indicate some kind of sediments, the uh, mission team was rather shocked because uh, as the camera came out from the spacecraft, and looked underneath it, they saw this uh, outcrop of pebbles and cobbles with cement in between. So here you see a rather big uh, cobble, rounded cobble. All of these are pebbles and cobbles. These are fluvial gravels. They're bedded like fluvial gravels. You, you can see gravel like this in the Channel Scab land. That was what the spacecraft landed on. It actually landed on a fluvial deposit. As the spacecraft, uh, uh, the uh, Curiosity uh, tooled around uh, Gale Crater, it went over to areas like this. You can see this surface looks like a bunch of mud cracks. Uh, those of you who are familiar with mud cracks and mud puddles know that it, they form because you have fine clay that has been brought in by the water. And when it dries, it cracks. So these are beds of clay. This was a lake that was sitting on the bottom of Gale Crater uh, billions of years ago. Uh, so details are showing that Mars was a very uh, wet, uh, Earth-like, but not Earth like, uh, let's say here in Portland, where I am now in Oregon, but maybe a, a more uh, extreme kind of environment, but still watery and wet. Okay, so in the news, uh, the one that's been uh, uh, because of a landing this year, uh, most in the news is a lander called Perseverance. <laughs> Very similar in appearance to Curiosity, but bigger uh, with modifications that were made to improve its uh, ability. Uh, Curiosity had trouble with uh, damage to the wheels, so they improved the wheels. They have all kinds of fancy devices, and the one that was in the news the most is a little helicopter. Uh, uh, this, this little helicopter. Uh, You've probably seen the, the news stories. It's called Ingenuity. Here's the picture of it. Uh, this really didn't do any science. It was an engineering uh, 
experiment that perhaps can be used in future missions. This is an actual picture out of uh, the Perseverance. I mean, it looks like a, you know, a scene out of Death Valley or something, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the hill in the background is actually part of a fluvial delta. Uh, here is the general region of the landing site. The colors uh, relate to the spectra that are produced by different clay minerals. And you can see that the feature that they landed near is a fluvial delta. These are distributary channels. Uh, and the uh, flat area was uh, probably a lacustrine basin. The lander is sort of uh, uh, kind of up where my arrow here, just to the uh, just to the southeast of the delta. And the mission plan is to uh, maybe look at some of these uh, little isolated uh, pieces of delta, but to go up uh, the channel way and uh, go into the highlands where there's different uh, kinds of rocks. That may take place over a longer period of time. <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned one last mission. And this is one that hasn't been in the news very much, uh, but uh, it has a really important result. It was a stationary lander, not so exciting, that put out two instruments. The one on the right is a little drill that wasn't very successful. It, it attempted to drill down maybe a couple of meters. I don't remember the exact depth. But the idea was to measure the temperature difference between the surface and the depth. And that would show whether there was a, uh, a certain amount of heat flow coming out of Mars. <clears throat> the other instrument is under this little dome. And it's a seismometer that is basically like a very uh, sensitive spring that can uh, respond to Mars quakes. If you have a, a Mars quake, it could be caused by a meteor hitting the planet, a landslide, some kind of internal disturbance, maybe volcanism. You will send what are essentially sound waves through the rock. And the uh, nature of the rock uh, will control how fast those waves move. So uh, using a lot of computer uh, programs and the like, uh, properties of the rock can be determined uh, from Mars quakes. And what this has found, and these results were just announced uh, last month, <clears throat> is that Mars uh, still has a liquid core shown here uh, in the diagram. It has a, uh, above that is a mantle of um, a special kind of rock. The mantle of the earth exists below the zone of rocks like we see on the surface. This is called the crust of the earth. <clears throat> but the mantle uh, characteristics of Mars are very unusual in comparison to the earth. It's because Mars is much smaller than the Earth. And th these two pi, uh, pi diagrams show the internal structure of the Earth in the big pi uh, slice and Mars in the little pi slice. And what you see in black is the crust, the kind of rock that's like what we have on uh, the surface of the Earth. And then underneath that, above the yellow zone or core, uh, you have a mantle. <clears throat> the blue area is a part of the mantle that can store a lot of water. This water got into the Earth's mantle because of plate tectonics, <coughs> Sub subduction. <coughs> and uh, on Mars, <coughs> that uh, water-rich zone, is right next to the core. This is an old diagram that, that suggested that the core might be frozen. Well, the core of Mars is at least partly molten. And that's important for generating volcanism. One of the mysteries of Mars had been that it, <clears throat> its surface 
uh, has had very recent volcanism. And the volcanism can also drive water to the surface. So uh, these are diagrams from a paper I did with colleagues about uh, 14 years ago uh, that's considering the early history of Mars and how it got water when it initially formed in the, uh, along with the formation of the sun. And that water got transported by plate tectonic processes into the core mantle boundary area. And that water periodically comes back up associated with volcanism. And that is a reason why Mars has been able to have this uh, ability <clears throat> to switch between conditions like a scene out of Matt Damon in a movie, The Martian, which is what Mars is like today, to maybe not a tropical paradise, but one with a lot of water, probably snow around, uh, <clears throat> maybe like uh, northern parts of Canada, with the sky kind of like uh, like a Scotland all the time, you know, kind of dreary and dark, but with a with a lot of water around. <clears throat> and this means that Earth is a very special place because it is a planet that has a surface. And you notice the color of the, the surface here. This is a space photograph of Earth. And you see Africa. And Africa has this, this uh, sort of hue. Uh, and then this is a, a Mars. And you notice the similarity. What you see in uh, images of Earth is that of the three uh, characteristics of, uh, of certain compound, water, it's present on the surface. The liquid is in the ocean. The uh, ice is at the poles. Here's the Antarctica. And you have clouds in the atmosphere. But most of the Earth, 70%, is ocean. So if you were going to name a planet, if you were like an alien, like we talked about at the very beginning, but coming from another solar system, and you saw this planet, you wouldn't call this planet Earth. You'd call this planet water. But if you saw this other planet, which looks like the, the, the land surface of the Earth, that's the one you'd call Earth because it doesn't have the evidence of the big water on its surface. But it did in its past. And another interesting thing about this big picture is that Earth has gone between phases of being very warm. And as you well know, we're in a warm phase right now, and very cold. There were times in the ancient Earth past, a billion, two billion years ago, when Earth was completely covered by ice. It was an, a, an ice house. And other times, like today, when it's a, a greenhouse. Now, Mars had times when it was able to be warm enough that it had water on the surface. But when it turned into an ice house, that water all went underground. So it, and this is because Mars is much colder. It's further away in the solar system than Earth is. So Mars has lessons for us about our own Earth. And that's one of the reasons why we study this business of uh, planetary uh, geology. So <clears throat> I hope that's been an introduction to you. And uh, if, if you're thinking like scientists, you probably all have lots of questions. So I will uh, close up at this point. I hope. I that the panelists are still there. I'm, I'm still here. Thank you, Vic. OK, so, OK. So questions, people. I uh, have to do them through, is it through chat? I didn't hear that we're going to throw it open to where people can say anything. I, I have a question. OK. Um, well, 
is there, and this wouldn't come directly from the geology, well, what about the, the atmosphere? Would you, is there, have you, in any of the papers you worked on, any of the work you've done, have you, and because the hydrologic cycle, have you had the atmosphere being very different or even different pressure and so on? Uh, on Mars. Yeah, yes. Uh, obviously, we don't have uh, direct samples of the uh, atmosphere. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Mars past with, with that kind of capability isn't present. We do have samples of Earth's path atmosphere, of course, because in glacial ice, you have uh, preserved samples of the past atmosphere and and it's from that we know how carbon dioxide has changed in Earth's atmosphere over time. But we don't have direct samples from Mars, so we have to think about it indirectly. But we do know that the atmospheric pressure must have been larger in the past to permit uh, flowing water, for example, or the uh, long span of time for lakes. Uh, if you have a low atmospheric pressure, the water very quickly evaporates uh, away. Uh, and uh, so one of the big questions is how do you sequester a, an atmosphere? And the interesting thing, and here's a, here's a good thought for you. The atmosphere that Mars has sequestered in the past is a carbon dioxide atmosphere. Mars has naturally put out lots of carbon dioxide and take it, taken it back in to the subsurface. Now, now, how did it do that? That would be really great if we could do that. <laughs> uh, so here's a, uh, a thing Mars did. It, we, of course, it's possible it did this over millions of years, which isn't gonna help us with our current global warming process. But there's some suggestion that, that it could have happened fairly rapidly, uh, that it may have something to do with the uh, transitions in climate, that the, uh, that the atmosphere gets uh, and the carbon can be precipitated. Uh, that's a way to you, you put the carbon not into, uh, into coal or oil, you put it into carbonates. And we think that may have happened on Mars. Uh, so yeah, this is a big issue. How, how did the, what was the character like in the past uh, uh, Mars? Uh, because to make the valley networks, one had to have I lost it for we lost it for a few seconds, Vic. Carbon dioxide, dry ice. Okay. 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 Yeah. Now we're getting a couple of uh, questions in the chat. <clears throat> One is, uh, why don't you? Ever, well, I don't know. What the first one is? Why don't you ever see the object that made all those impact craters? Well. Um, that was a kind of an important question in the early days of figuring out about impact craters. Uh, some of you may be familiar with a feature in Northern Arizona called impact crater, uh, meteor crater, okay? It, it, it actually uh, originally was known as uh, Coon Bluff. I guess they found the coon there. And uh, so it's a big hole in the ground. And there was a, a guy who ultimately became the owner of it uh, named Beringer, who uh, sought for years to find the iron meteorite that had made it. Obviously, a big piece of iron comes in. There were little tiny little pieces of iron they found around it, but they, he, he dug, he, he thought he'd make a fortune finding this big mass of iron. Never found anything. <laughs> when you have an impact cratering, and this has been found, the object that is coming into the surface of the earth comes in at like 10 to 30 kilometers per second. 
Now, uh, energy is uh, mass times velocity squared. Velocity 10 kilometers per second, you square that, that is a very big number that you multiply by mass. So it doesn't get to be a very big, We've lost your feet, I think, Vic, just halfway, halfway through that answer after the MV squared part. And I think you'll probably come back in a second. I don't know if you can hear me. It's like when a cell phone connection is having problems. Uh, oh, I think we lost you. So if, if we wait a minute, I bet you Vic will try joining back in. Personally, I would guess, although I can't speak for Vic. Oh, here's a new message. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Maria, I think it was from Maria, the, the Arwenetchi Valley Museum of History and Culture and so on. Um, person who's helping run this, this whole talk in zoom i think that's where i get the message from yeah she's trying he's trying Vic is trying to log back in or join the zoom meeting again i'm back there you are yeah okay yeah i had a temporary disconnect so I was in the middle of an explanation, but it was a little too long and windy anyway. So, <laughs> well, I think we got the gist where the the velocity squared and all that energy it just it destroys the impactor pretty much, or it, yes, or it turns yeah. it more more or less vaporizes yeah. it. That's right. That, that that's what happens. I, obviously, very small meteorites uh, they may survive. Uh, and and there are examples of people, you know, picking them up and that sort of thing. But those are like, you know, the size of little pebbles and things. Okay, and then another question uh, is, do you think it's possible for future volcanism that might bring water once again to the surface of Mars? Yeah, um, there was a recent paper that showed uh, what may have been a volcanic event uh, within the last few thousand years. It, it, it's still controversial. Uh, and uh, we do know from Martian rocks that, that there, there is water associated with them. Uh, so volcanic activity always has a, a release of gas. Uh, and the gas is related to the history of uh of the of how the water got into the source region which is generally the mantle of the planet so i briefly at the end of the talk talked about how some water might have gotten in the martian subsurface so yes water could come out by that process the way a lot of water would come on the surface uh would be because mars pretty clearly has a lot of ground ice uh sometimes people call this permafrost and if you have volcanism that, that uh, is associated with that, you can get releases of water. Uh, and that can make floods. In, in Iceland, there are occasional floods that take place because of volcanic eruptions underneath uh, glaciers and ice caps. And that produces giant floods. But uh, those are rare on Earth. For Mars, they are even rarer, but early Mars, that was more, much more common. Okay. So, okay, well, then I have another question. That, like that 1993 question of whether this was too outrageous a hypothesis, was that because you and your colleagues went from channels and localized bodies of water to the oceans covering, you know, uh, ocean scale bodies of water? Yeah. Was, was that the, the so-called outrageous part? Right. Okay. 
is that is that now considered less outrageous and somewhat or a lot more accepted um yeah it it is uh more accepted because uh, numerous lines of evidence have come about that are consistent with that idea i wouldn't say it's totally accepted there, there's still people that are trying to come up with different arguments about it that i kind of facetiously called the hydrophobes uh, but um, uh, just the, so many different lines of evidence are consistent with that idea that the alternative would be that you find something really totally exotic that can also explain all that line of evidence. And it gets increasingly difficult to do that. Yeah, we, we never have an absolute uh, answer in science, but we, what we do is we continue to get more and more productive lines of thinking. And that seems to be where we are with the oceans. We, we don't fully understand exactly how they operated, but we know that we're sort of on the line, uh, on the right track, it, kind of like a detective following a, a set of clues. And uh, that seems to be where we are with that hypothesis. Okay, well, now I see the tool is available and one person is taking advantage of it for Q and A uh, instead of chat. So we got one more question. Um, are there from from James from Jim Bailey, James Bailey? Are there future missions planned to go to the, get to the poles and get core samples to find out about past atmospheres? It's probably been talked about. And yes, that certainly there are advocates for these. Uh, <clears throat> in that, there is a NASA program that uh, invites. Uh, various members of the community to propose mission concepts, but it is a competition with the uh, exploration of the whole solar system. So <laughs> in the near future, uh, two missions that have uh, come into a lot of uh, attention lately have been two Venus missions because Venus has been neglected for quite a long time. Uh, pretty much since uh, for about 30 years, since the early uh, 1990s. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, excitement about that. But there are uh, many future Mars missions. The, the thing about Mars, and I didn't get enough time to talk about that, is lots of other countries are interested in Mars. In, in the current round, uh, China put a lander and rover uh, on Mars. So there is a uh, Chinese lander and rover mission. Uh, China, uh, China's future plans are not that, uh, you know, exact. We don't, we don't know them that well, but definitely China uh, has plans. Uh, the United Arab Emirates put a satellite around Mars. Uh, India put a satellite around Mars. Uh, Japan has a Mars uh, mission plans. Uh, so uh, the European Union has a has a very good uh, plan for another Mars uh, mission with rover and uh, uh, exploration. Uh, a lot of focus on looking for life. So there's a lot of a lot of activity that's going to occur in the next uh, decade. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. This has certainly been a great, I certainly learned a ton from things that were being learned way back in previous decades to things that were being announced last month and so on. I really, um, not that you were promising to teach us everything about Mars, but just what you focused on, certainly I learned a ton, um, including the, the, you know, the relation of the, flood features big flood features to how that got started from what we learned here so uh yeah so i'm gonna thank you vic and you know i wish we could all be heard or clap and so on for your okay. for your talk i'm glad we're able okay. to do this I'm, I'm, I'm being optimistic that maybe even by the time next summer comes if we have the opportunity to get you back it'll be in person um and, and in the meantime maybe before then we'll start having in-person meetings again i'll keep my fingers crossed i hope so so okay well th thank you very much for uh organizing things so well and thanks to the audience uh
it's uh, it, I agree it isn't the best way to do these sorts of things and uh, I, I, I hope it uh, introduced you to, to something that's uh, pretty fascinating and th there's a lot to it that you just can't see through the regular news and sound by TV and all of that sort of thing. Oh yeah, I think it worked well. I mean, it's not yeah. quite in person in some ways. We can't go out and talk afterwards, but um, but I think it was quite effective. So thanks again. Okay, yeah. well, see you next year. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everybody. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. So I don't know if Maria's there right now. Probably she is. I am. I'll go ahead and close everything out. Thank you so much. Thank you. That that worked well. Perfect. Thank okay, you, Dr. Thank, Baker. That was great. Thank you. Thank you for the organization and technology and all of that. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Have a good evening. Thanks okay. to you. you. You do the same. Bye. Okay. Bye, Vic. Bye.